Well, good morning. I am very, very excited to be here. It was a very flattering thing when Jason called me and he asked me if I would come and speak and uh, to preach. As has already been said, my name is Josh McDaniel. I was with Jason when he was the youth pastor at Ridgecrest Baptist Church. And he took me on the single worst trip I've ever been on in my life. So understand, my prayers for those in Alaska right now are extra hard. <laughs> no, I, I, I know that they are going to be blessed, that they are going to absolutely go in the power of the Lord, that the Spirit will guide them, that he will, he will bring forth the gospel. I know Jason preaches the gospel. It's one of the reasons why when I look back on my time in the youth ministry, I look back at it with such fondness. Because the gospel is preached, because the gospel is proclaimed. One thing that Jason made sure to tell us every time he stood up to preach, I'm sure he does it even now, is that there is no sermon that is a success if you have not walked away without presenting the gospel. This is Father's Day. I come here, I am a father. I have a sweet, beautiful little girl who's 12, going on 22. I have a curly-headed little boy who is 9, going on 7. Because boys go backwards. I sent up here as a father. I sent up here thrilled to be here. And we're going to look today in the scriptures. We're going to, listen, we're, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to confess to you, I'm fighting off a chunk, all right? We are going from Genesis 1 to 22 today. And we're going we're gonna to do it, all right? We're going to look at the life of Father Abraham. We're going to do a character study of him. But what I want to draw to your attention first and foremost of all is that as we look at the life of Abraham, you need to know that just like Jason made sure to preach all those years ago and all those sermons ago with me, looking at Father Abraham does not mean we will neglect the gospel. No, no, no. The life of Father Abraham, the stories about his life and everything that he encountered you see the gospel plainly. In fact, it is so rich as we look at the life of Abraham that perhaps we'll even have a newfound appreciation for how God established the skeletal structure of the gospel here in Genesis. We're going to hopefully see that this morning. So, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Genesis. First, we'll read from Genesis chapter 3, but before we get to the life of uh, Abraham, we're going to kind of walk through things that we already know about Genesis. Genesis is the first book of the Bible, but it is a book of the Bible that perfectly sets up the gospel. Let me go ahead and let me... Let me Explain to you just something that, that helped me out a lot when I come to study the Bible. We are Americans. We have a Western mindset, okay? And that is good. When we come to stories, when we come to understanding and reading, we have a very Westerner's mindset to that. And what I mean by that is we see things in a line. We see things in stories with a beginning, a middle, and an end. We look at the line of a story, and that's a good thing. But the Bible is not a Western book. The Bible is not an American book. It is Eastern. It was written a long time ago in a place far away from this. And this is the way they write their stories. And it's true across the board. They don't go in a line. Now, we do have a Bible that we have done a very good job of putting and compiling the books together in a line. So we have a structure that works for us, but the way they write books in the East 
is they've got one central core idea. One idea. And they tell a lot of stories. And every single one of those stories points to the main idea. That's the way the Bible works. There's one main idea, and every single story in the Bible is pointing to that one idea. Do you know what the one idea of the Bible is? It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to ask you to maybe challenge your minds a little bit this morning. Get out of our Western mindset. Don't look at it in the sense of a beginning, middle, and end. Look at it that this story is pointing to a key theme of the Bible. It's pointing to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We know this story really well, how the first thing that happens in all of Scripture, what is the first thing? What is, what's the first story in the Bible? Kids can tell us this. You, everyone knows what's the first story in the Bible. Creation. God creates everything, and he does it beautifully through the breath of his voice. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Through just talking, he creates everything except for people. Except people. People are different. What does the Bible say he does with them? It says he takes from the dust of the ground, and he forms them. In his hand. Why is that so significant? Because there's something different about people. With people, he's going to have an intimacy with. He's going to have a relationship with. He's going to be hands-on with them in a way that's different than all creation. We see that beautifully come to life as Adam has a unique, intimate relationship with God. Eve does as well. But the story does not end with creation. It continues to go. In Genesis chapter 3, we all know the story. The serpent comes. The serpent tempts Eve. Eve is deceived. Adam is deceived. They take of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, a tree that God told them, do not eat that fruit, and they ate that fruit. And they sin. Now, here's where we need to start wrapping our minds around this story is pointing to the central truth of the Bible. Okay, here's where we need to wrap our minds around it. Because from here on out, once sin enters into the story, you see nothing but God's grace. And the gospel is nothing if it's not a story of God's grace. And so we need to see right here, sin enters into the world. We know the story. This is familiar. We've got this, okay? They eat of that fruit, and all of a sudden, sin enters the world. Death should follow because the curse of sin is death. Everything is about to go down. And, and, and you get the sense, too, when, when it says that that. that they took of the fruit, and then they, they tried to sow fig leaves together. They tried to hide from God, and God shows up in the garden to walk with them. And he says, where are you? And every parent in here gets that. There are times when I was playing hide-and-seek with my children where this was their hiding place. And I say, where are you? But even more than that, there were times when my children, particularly my little boy, had done something he knew was wrong. And he would go hide in a place that was very obvious. And instead of me reaching into the closet and dragging him out or reaching under the bed to pull him out to be punished for that, I would just walk into the room and I'd say, where are you? Knowing full well where he was. God walks into the garden, where are you? out, they blame everybody except for themselves, and then it happens. In Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 14, you see what's known as the Proto-Evangelium. It's the 
first mention of the gospel in all of the Bible. Let me read it to you. Beginning Genesis chapter 3, verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. Here it is. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. There it is. Did you catch it? Do you see it? Have you seen it before? Serpent, you have deceived Adam, you have deceived Eve. Death is the curse of sin. Sin has now entered the world. This is the reality that they live in here now. And that we live in here now. But God is going to send someone born of the woman. And this child that's going to be born. This one who's going to come. This one is going to crush the head of the serpent. Is going to crush the work that the serpent did in the garden. But in the process, he's going to be hurt. In the process. He will suffer. But someone's coming. Someone's coming. And that someone is going to undo all of the sin that has just entered the world. So, what I'm going to ask you to do now. Imagine for the remainder of our time that you're hearing this story for the very first time. Imagine that you're reading this story for the first time. I'm going to try and take you there mentally. I'm going to try and take you to that place because when we read this story, particularly if we do it with a lens like this is the first time we're ever hearing these things, we get gut punch after gut punch after gut punch and we see grace upon grace upon grace. So, someone's coming. Who is this someone? If you're reading this story for the first time, at that point, your mind goes on a fever pitch. Who is it that's coming? Who is this child? Where is this child coming? Is it going to be a child who's born of this woman, of Eve? Who is this child? The next story in Genesis is Chapter 4, we have Cain and Abel. You're like, okay, there's the child. There they are. Cain or Abel, that's one of them. That's got to be the child. And we know that story. That's not the child. Cain rises up to kill his brother Abel. This cannot be the child. Where's this child who's going to undo the work? Where's this child who's going to crush the head of the serpent? Where is this one? And Genesis makes us feel the weight of our longing in three very significant words. Flip to Genesis chapter 5. This is the book of in verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and named them man when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. The days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years. Here are those three words. And he died. You're reading this for the first time. Those three words hit you like a truck. Because we're waiting on this child. But Adam died. Well, maybe it's Seth. Maybe Seth will be the child. 
that can get us there. But look at verse 8. Thus all the days of Seth were 912 years. They're the same three words, and he died. Look at verse 11. Thus all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. Look at verse 14. Thus all the days of Kenan were 910 years, and he died. Verse 17. Thus all the days of Mahalo were 895 years, and he died. Verse 20. Thus all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. And you start feeling the weight of this curse. You start seeing the gravity of what happened in the garden. And he died is a part of everybody's story. And it's coming for you. And it's coming for me. And there's nothing that we can do about it. We're waiting on a child. What in the world is going to happen? How are we going to get out of this cycle? And all of a sudden, three very different words are introduced to the narrative. Let me read them to you. Verse 21. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God. Three very different words. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years, had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. We're getting nervous. We're getting scared because it's coming to the end of the story. It says, Enoch walked with God. And he was not. For God took him. Enoch must have been the child. Enoch must have been the one. He must have been the serpent crusher because he walked with God and now there's no more death. Finally we have it. And that's what you're thinking if you're reading it with verse 7. Like, yes, there's the answer. But no, it's not. Because if you look down at verse 27, that's all the days of Methuselah were 969 years. And he died. And it keeps going on. And so for the first time reader, which I'm asking you to go to that place, for the first time reader, you look at this story and you sit there and think, what is this walk with God? Because right now my choices, my options seem to be walk with God or and he died. I want to walk with God. I don't want to die. What is this walk with God? It tells us nothing. But obviously Enoch was not the serpent crusher. Obviously Enoch was not the one who could take away the work of the serpent. Because even though he walked with God, that's not been attributed to me or anybody else. What is this walk with God? And if you're reading it for the first time, you're going crazy trying to figure it out. The next chapter. The next chapter we're introduced to someone else who has those same three words said about him. Genesis chapter 6. Let's look at verse 9 and 10. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Jacob. You continue reading through this, you think, here it is, walk with God again. Maybe Noah will give us some clues. Maybe Noah will give us an idea about what this walk with God is. Maybe we can figure it out here. What is the walk with God? We got nothing from Enoch's story. Maybe there's more with Noah, and there is. There's certainly a lot more with Noah. We get, it's, it, it, it's, it's meticulous how uh, how God goes out there and if you keep reading through chapter 6 it says in verse 15 this is how you are to make it talking about the ark the length of the ark 300 cubits its breadth 50 cubits its height 30 cubits make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark in its side make it with lower second and third decks he goes through all these kinds of these hey this is what you do Follow this instruction. Follow this instruction. Follow this instruction. Obey this way. Obey this way. And then when you get 
to verse 22. It says, Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. And so the first time reader says, there it is. That's what walk with God must be. That's what it must mean. Walk with God must mean that I just have to obey him perfectly. That I have to do everything he says. That instead of being in the state of rebellion like they were in the garden when they took the fruit, maybe if I just do what I'm supposed to do, maybe if I just obey God, maybe then that's walk with God. Maybe then I get to have walk with God be my story, not and he died. Maybe it's just obedience. And so you start to kind of get wrapped up in this because then all of a sudden Noah doesn't die in the flood. And you're like, yeah, he was obedient. And so because he was obedient, that's why God saved him. There it is. I can, I can be more obedient than sinful. I can, I can do that. I, maybe I can handle that. For the first time, reader, you're starting to latch on to something. Okay, okay, I can do this. I can do this. Until you get to chapter 9, verses 28 and 29. It says, after the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years. And he died. The same three words. The same awful three words. And for the first time reading, Everything that you've been hoping for, everything you've been jumping to, everything you've been so excited for, getting worked up over with Noah's story, it crumbles to the ground. Because you've been sitting there, you've been thinking, I thought I had it figured out. I thought it was about obedience. I thought it was about me just doing what I was told to do. I thought it was about me acting a right way. That's not what it is. And so your mind wanders and it struggles. And you go back to that one promise there in the garden. One day a child will be born of a woman. And he will crush the head of the serpent. And his heel will be struck. You go back to where you were at the beginning. I'm waiting for someone to be sent. I'm waiting for someone to come. You start to look for the child again. You read through a lot of descendants. You read through a lot of <laughs> genealogies. And every time you're sitting there looking for this child to be born. And a new very wonderful thing is brought to your attention when you get really let's let's look at uh, chapter 11 we'll look at verse 27 to start now these are the generations of Terah Terah fathered Abram, Nahor and Haran, Haran fathered Lot Haran died in the presence of his father so I guess Haran was not the child Terah in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. I guess it's not Terah either. Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Ishka. So you're looking, where's, where's the child coming from? Where's this child? Where is it going to be? Verse 30. Now Sarai was barren. She had no child. Well, obviously, the child of promise, obviously, Abraham is not, well, in Abram's name, by the way, you, you guys know right, that Abram's name didn't change to Abraham. If it didn't, spoiler alert. <laughs> Abram's name gets changed to Abraham. But you sit there and you read it and you think, well, it can't be Abraham, it can't be Sarah, because they can't have children. 
They can't even follow in obedience there. You know, the first commandment that was given to Adam and Eve, the first thing God told them to do, the first instruction he gave them is be fruitful and multiply. Abraham and Sarah, they can't even do that. They can't even do that. They're definitely not going to be the ones to bring about children. They're not going to be the ones to bring out any child of promise. And then chapter 12 comes along. Now remember, you're looking for a child to be born. You understand that it's not about what we can do. It's not about the strength of our obedience. It's not about the power of our will. It's not about what we can do with our hands, feet, our eyes, or our minds. It's got to be waiting for God to do something. In chapter 12, verse 1, Now the Lord said to Abel, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you. I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And out of nowhere, wait a minute, the one guy who can't even obey the most essential, basic thing that God has said. The one guy who can't even follow God through in obedience there. He's the one? Why? Why is he the one? He has nothing to bring to the table. He has nothing that he can offer. There is no strength in his family. Why? Because his wife can't have children. So why this guy? And beautifully, remarkably, wonderfully, we come to the realization it's not because of the strength or might of Abraham, but it's because of the Grace of God. The grace of God is what we have to hang our entire life on. It's what we have to rest our entire existence on. The grace of God. Not to look at some sort of might in my hands or not to look at some sort of character uh, uh, characteristic that I might have. No. I have to rest on the grace of God. But Abraham and it always, it's always shocked me. It's always surprised me when you read um in the Old Testament, or when you read in the, the New Testament, you see the Pharisees, and you see the Sadducees, and, and they're always talking about, oh, how great Abraham was, oh, how wonderful Abraham was. If you talk to a person who is uh, a, a Jewish person today, they talk about how wonderful and amazing Abraham was, and, and I kind of want to tell you, don't, don't, don't you get it? Don't you understand? The story's not about Abraham. Even though his name is there, the story's not about his might. The story's not about his renown. It's about what God's grace is going to do. Don't you get it? By the way, the Bible makes sure to tell us that Abraham didn't deserve this honor. Not only do we understand that he couldn't have children, but before that chapter ends, where God tells him that he's going to be a blessing to all the nations because of his family. Before that chapter even ends, Abraham sins in a terrible way. He tells Pharaoh in Egypt, he says, because his wife was beautiful, he says, he says, this is not my wife, it's my sister. And so Pharaoh takes her into his power. Sins greatly because of Abraham. The Bible makes sure to let us know, no, it's not about his strength, it's not about his might, it's not about his power, but it's about the grace of God to overcome any and all of our sins, any and all of our deficiencies. We get to chapter 15, and I love this. I love this. We're going to spend a little bit of time 
The reason why we're going to spend a little bit of time here is because so often <coughs> we pass by this and we don't get it. So let me kind of break down what's going on. We'll look at just chapter 15, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. The heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Abram starts to falter. He starts to feel the weight like all of us have felt that there's no child coming. Where is the child? You said that it was going to be with Abram and Sarai or Abraham and Sarah. Where's the child? Where's the child? I understand it's got to be a grace. But where's the child? So God does this. And it's strange. It's strange to our American uh, and to our Western mindset. This is what God tells him to do. Look at verse 7. He said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And he's saying, I, where, where's the proof? It's not happening. Where is it? He said to him, this is verse 9, bring me a heifer, three years old, a female goat, three years old, a ram, three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought them all these. Cut them in half. And laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Wait a minute. God said to bring in these animals, and then Abram cuts them in half? What is this? Why did he do that? How, how does that make sense at all? Bring me all these animals. Bring me a heifer that's three years old, a female goat three years old, ram three years old, turtle dove, young pigeon. Bring them. And Abram just cuts them in half. And then he drags the bodies apart from each other. Why did he do that? What's the point? Something's going on here. That we don't do today, obviously. At the time when this was written, there was a covenant that was instituted multiple times over and over again. It was called the Covenant of the Suzerain King. The Suzerain King was the highest king of the land. The mightiest, the most powerful king of the land. And that suzerain king, when he would go and when he would look at a lesser ruler or at a lesser servant, he would make a promise to that servant. And he would say to that servant, I will be your king. You will be my servant. You will be my even slave. You shall serve me. You shall obey me. But this covenant took place in a very odd and strange way. This is what they would do with the covenant. They would bring these exact animals to the table. And they would take those animals and they would cut them in half. And then they would drag the carcasses away from each other. Why would they do that? It would leave on the ground this bloody path. Almost like a bloody red carpet. And then this is what the suzerain king and the lower king would do. They would walk together through that blood path. They would walk together through the blood. And when they would walk together, 
They would do it, and the suzerain king, the higher king, would look at the lesser servant, and he would say this to them. He would say, I will be your king. You will live under my protection. You will be my servant. You will enjoy all of the things that come with living in my kingdom. You will be mine, and I will be yours. But if you disobey, if you Stray, if you deceive me, then the thing that happens to these animals, that is the curse that will be upon you. The suzerain king would walk the path. And it was a fearful thing to walk that path because if he ever disobeyed that king, then the king had all the right to put you death. So bringing these animals, Abraham does it. He knows what those animals are for. He cuts them in half. He makes a blood pact. Now look at what happens in verse 12. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on him. And behold, dreadful great darkness fell upon him. Why would dreadful darkness fall upon him? Why would fear creep in? God himself is saying, I'm about to make this covenant with you. You are going to see that I am going to be there with you. I'm going to be your God. You're going to be mine. Why is Abram so afraid? Why? It's very simple. Because he knows that he cannot walk in obedience with God. As soon as he was given the covenant in chapter 12, immediately he sinned against God. He knows the story of Noah. He knows that Noah could not obey perfectly. He knows that every single person who's gone before him has suffered the three awful words and he died. He knows that sin is great in his life and he knows he cannot walk the path. He knows that he cannot walk with God through the bloody path. He can't do it. He can't honor his end of the deal. So deep, dreadful darkness falls upon him. Verse 17. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. And he goes on to list how far this land will go. What just happened? What happened? God knew Abraham couldn't hold up his end of the bargain. God knew Abram would fail. God knew Abram would sin. By the way, the very next chapter, you know what Abram does? He sins again. God knew that Abram would fail. So what did God do? God made the covenant with Abraham, but he didn't do it having Abraham walk beside him. God literally walked with Abraham. God through that blood path to make the covenant. How do I know that? Because in Exodus, God shows up to the Israelites in a cloud by day and fire by night. And here we see a smoking fire pot, a flaming torch, passing between pieces. What am I saying? God said or showed Abraham right then and there. I know you can't keep your end of the bargain. I know you can't do it. But I'm going to make this covenant with you. And Abraham, if he 
you fail, if you sin, if you stray, the death of these animals, the curse of these animals, will not fall upon you. It will fall upon the one who walked with you. God makes a covenant side by side with God. And if Abraham falls, the death falls upon God. Hopefully your minds can already fast forward to the life of Christ. If they have it there, got one more story in Abraham's life quickly to show you. Chapter 22. Isaac has been born by this time. Abraham's son has been born. The only son After these things, this is verse 1, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains on which I shall tell you. You've got one son of promise, Abraham, just one. Killed him. Put him to death. Let's skip down to verse 9. When they came to the place which God had told them, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his Son, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God. See, you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered up offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Understand, in this story, we see a further look at what's going to happen in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We understand that none of us, Abraham included, none of us can walk with God. None of us can fulfill our end of the bargain. None of us can keep perfect obedience with him. None of us have the strength. None of us have the power. None of us have the ability to do that. But God, in his gracious act, said, I will still give you a promise of eternal life. I will still give you a promise of living forever in a place with me. I will still give that to you. But if and when you fail, the punishment will not fall upon you, but will fall upon me. And it did fall upon him when God himself took his only begotten son. He marched him up a hill. And on that hill of Calvary, his son was crucified and died so that you and I can be saved. And we can have the promise that God has given. Understand God's grace is clearly seen in the life of Abraham and it's a foreshadowing of exactly what is about to come. You look for the child all throughout this book and you don't see the child but you see the child pointed at constantly. Who is it who's going to walk with God? Who is it who's going to live in perfect obedience? It's not me, it's not you. But we know the answer to that is Jesus Christ. 
Jesus walked with God through that blood path. And because of our sin, not because of his, because of our sin, Jesus was offered as the only son of God for a sacrifice so that you and I can be saved. By the way, this is a really interesting note. There is some discussion, there is some debate on where this hill was that Abraham took his son to be sacrificed. We don't know exactly which hill it is, but every serious scholar who looks at the geography they recognize that this hill is somewhere very close to the hill that our Lord was crucified upon. Oh, what a gracious God. What an amazing Father. What an incredible gospel that Abraham points to. Just to bring it full circle. Just to bring it full circle. I had a child one time ask me, well, how did Enoch do it? How did Enoch walk with God? I don't, I don't understand. How did Enoch walk with God? The Bible gives us nothing in the Old Testament. No clues at all. When we get to the book of Hebrews, however, you don't have to flip there. I'll read it to you. Hebrews 11. Five. It says, by faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. He was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists, that he rewards those who seek him. How did he not do it? He had faith in the God who would provide a means of salvation. He had faith. It wasn't because Enoch had some sort of extracurricular spiritual power that we don't possess. No, it's because he had faith. He had faith in God to provide a means of salvation. It goes on even further, and I love this, by faith, Noah. Being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he was commended, uh, by this he com condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. How did Noah walk with God? By faith. In faith that God will save. That God and God alone saves. Verse 8, by faith, Abraham obeyed. He was called to go to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. What is it? What is this walking with God? What is it? It's understanding that you have no strength of your own to save yourself. What is this walking with God? It's faith. It's faith in the only person who can do something about it. It's having faith in the only one who can walk with God. It's having faith in the only person who can assume that sacrifice on our behalf. It's having faith in the only begotten Son of God, our Lord Savior, Jesus Christ. So fathers, sons, daughters, young ones, this is Father's Day. And understand that the life of Abraham and his family pointed to the gospel. Here's my question for you. 
just as the Bible was written, for every story points to the gospel, so your life has been provided for you to point to the gospel. How is your life, how is your family pointing to the gospel? And if it's not, maybe today the day where you put your faith Gracious Heavenly Father, we do love you and we do praise you. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the reality of your son and everything that he has accomplished on our behalf. I thank you that we don't have to trust in our own strength, that we don't have to trust in our own abilities, that we don't have to trust in our obedience. But Father, we can trust in the obedience of your son. We can trust in the sacrifice of your son. And I pray that you would make your gospel even more real to us today on Father's Day. Where we look at the life of a father whose family clearly pointed to their son. I pray we would desire to point to your son today, tomorrow. Father, that we would live in the faith of your son Jesus because that is the only thing that can save us. And it's in his name we do ask these things for sake. Amen.